Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. It is decision day for the Fed, with traders eyeing the future pace of rate cuts. Asian stocks mixed after U.S. equities touch fresh record highs. As the UK awaits the latest inflation data over on the continent, ECB President Christine Lagarde will make one of her most important speeches of the year. Plus, Bloomberg learns that the Biden administration is considering sanctioning Huawei's Chinese chip network as part of a campaign to protect U.S. security. Let's check in on these markets then. Fresh rallies, fresh highs, I should say, notched up by U.S. markets yesterday. The tech story was back. NVIDIA, the gains coming through for MAG7 once again. It's a slightly more nuanced picture as we count down then to the Fed decision. Of course, rates expected to be kept on hold. It is the economic projections, the dot plots that will be in focus, as will any detail around the discussions on the balance sheet of the Fed as well. Futures, when it comes to the U.S. then, S&P futures pointing lower by just a tenth of here in Europe, we count down to that ECB speech, of course, from Christine Lagarde around 8.40 UK time at the inflation data out of the UK. 7 a.m. UK time going to be really consequential, expected to fall to a two and a half year low. How that informs, of course, the debate amongst the BOE, that decision from the UK Central Bank, of course, on Thursday. FTSE 100 futures then lower by a tenth of a percent. S&P, we touched on that. Nasdaq futures down a tenth of a percent after the solid gains that came through again for the tech heavy index yesterday, the mega caps. Seven, of course, leading the charge. Let's flip the board and have a look cross asset then. Japan is closed, so we focus on currencies with the Japanese yen, of course, still being traded in the session. Further softness. Again, in the press conference that Governor Ueda gave yesterday, he did not lock in any further hikes after that historic hike, the first since 2007. So the softness continues for the Japanese yen in the session, currently at around 151 on Japanese yen. We're looking at euro dollar as well, 108. The pound in focus on the build-up to that inflation data expected to fall UK CPI to 3.5% year-on-year in the month of Feb from 4% in January, 127 on the pound. The Bloomberg dollar index up a tenth of a percent. Of course, that could be volatile as we lead up to the dot plots and any revisions that come through from the FOMC. Brent crude trading $87 a barrel, down a tenth of a percent. Let's cross over to Asia and see how the markets are shaping up so far in the session. Avril Hong standing by in Singapore. Avril, what are you looking at? out for the Fed, those dots as well as Powell's tone, that will be key to setting the tone for Asia equities. But I guess if you are a stock investor in equities there, going to benefit from the AI theme, that might not matter as much because we're seeing the likes of Tencent, Samsung, those are lifting a gauge of stocks, excluding Japan, which is of course closed today. Uh, and that's also helping the cost be, that's leading the charge today. Uh, for Tencent, we are expecting it's earnings to show perhaps a double-digit growth in earnings per share. Uh, that growth there, and this is according to Bloomberg Intelligence, it's expecting that continued strength from short videos as well as AI-related ads. Uh, so that is one thing to keep an eye on. We, of course, today also got out of China the loan prime rate rates are left unchanged by these Chinese lenders. This was as expected, but it doesn't seem to matter so much if you're looking at Chinese bonds because further out across the curve, it seems like there's still that continued speculation that we're going to get easing somewhere down the line. Equity is also showing that bit of positivity coming through. But let's for the board dig a bit deeper on Samsung. Um, today, it surged by the most since uh, about six months ago. And this is on the back of a report that NVIDIA is considering buying its high bandwidth memory chips. This is a crucial component for AI processors. So really showing how that NVIDIA reach is stretching across the supply chain. Samsung Electronics that rally there almost by 6% for the board again because as we count down to the fair, let's take a look at how the currencies are faring on the Korean won. We see a bit of strength. Let's flip the board and take a look at that. A bit of strength, but pretty tight ranges, all things considered. Of course, it's post-BOJ day. Uh, we're seeing the yen plumbing fresh lows against the greenback, lowest against the euro since 2008. It's all about the hawks and the doves, Tom. 
OK, Avril, thank you very much indeed. Of course, with the focus in Asia still on the Fed as well and those potential dot plot changes. Potential still, of course. A redhead crossing the terminal right now. Lonza, of course, the Swiss pharmaceutical company to buy the biologic site in the US from Roche for $1.2 billion US dollars in cash. Lons are planning to invest about 500 million Swiss francs to upgrade that facility. They're also putting out midterm guidance, 24 to 28, sales growth updated to 12 to 15 percent. But again, the redhead coming through from Lonza to buy that biologic site in the US from Roche for $1.2 billion in cash. We'll keep across that story, of course, throughout the next few hours as we continue to get more detail on it. Let's get back to the Fed question then. Likely, of course, the Fed to avoid signaling an imminent rate cut this week, staying focused on stubborn inflation while keeping one eye on a slowly rising jobless rate. Let's bring in Bloomberg M Live's Mark Cranfield then. Uh, Mark, a number of different scenarios that could unfold for, for markets, for traders, as we look ahead uh, to Fed Chair Jerome Powell, his press conference. The decision, of course, expected rates to stay on hold, but it's the presser and it's the adjustments, potential adjustments for those economic forecasts that will be in focus. Yeah, so we're really, traders are looking at three main scenarios here. We've got a potentially a pretty hawkish outlook. That would be the Federal Reserve lowers the dot plots to just two rate cuts for the rest of the year. That seems to be widely expected now. But then when Jerome Powell stands up in the press conference, he doesn't really push back against that. That would be a slight surprise, and that would be the most hawkish outcome. A slightly less hawkish outcome was we, we get the two dot plots, the reduction there. But then Jerome Powell uses the press conference to sound pretty dovish. He pushes back and tries to reassure investors that there's still rate cuts coming later in the year and there's nothing to worry about. Then the most unlikely but the do most dovish scenario would be that the dot plots stay at three rate cuts for this year and Jerome Powell sounds dovish in the press conference as well. And that would certainly be the one that the, most of the markets would like to see probably, but it's hmm. the least likely outcome today. OK, so some combination of the language at the press conference and the dot plots and how that plays out for these markets. How are markets, which parts of the market is, is most sensitive to some of those potential scenarios, Mark? Well, exactly as Ava was pointing out earlier, dollar yen is very much in play and they would be looking at it very closely, traders in the foreign exchange market. So we're not too far away from the November highs near 152 already. In theory, the Ministry of Finance in Japan is on holiday today, but they will be watching tonight for sure. They have an office in the New York, so they'll be watching closely. And if we get anywhere near 152 or higher, you may well see some headlines coming out on the terminals where the Ministry of Finance is pushing back and saying that dollar yen is getting too far and that they need to do something about it. If it goes even further, we may even have to see actual intervention to try and support the yen, but probably not verbal intervention first. The actual intervention may be delayed a little bit further. So certainly currency markets very much in play. It's not just dollar yen. Euro yen hit a 16 year high as well today. Treasury market, of course, will also be watching very closely. People seem to have been shorting treasuries pretty much going into the meeting. So if there's a risk, it's short covering. If it comes out slightly more dovish than expected, you expect people to jump in and buy treasuries here. So all parts of the universe are very active. The only people who really are going to just pass on the whole thing is equity market because all they care about is AI. They don't really care about the Fed. OK, the markets, the equity market still just obsessed with the AI rather than the Fed. But it does seem like we're set up for a very interesting day when it comes to those various different scenarios that you outlined for us. The yen firmly in focus and potential short covering in treasuries at the front end in particular, US two years. 151 currently on Japanese yen, down five tenths of a percent. So that currency pair uh, to look at later today as well. Mark Cranfield from our M Live team, thank you very much indeed for setting us up on that front. Now to geopolitics and the US Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, heading to Saudi Arabia and Egypt as we speak in his sixth visit to the Middle East since the war between Israel and Hamas began in October. The trip follows warnings from aid agencies that the looming famine in Gaza is worse than in Sudan or Afghanistan. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Paul Wallace then in Dubai for the details. Paul, immense pressure now on the US to exert more leverage on Israel, first on the ceasefire front, then on aid. What can Blinken reasonably expect to achieve this time? 
Hi, Tom. So, yes, he's back in the Middle East. He'll be in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia today and then in Cairo tomorrow to meet leaders in both places. I think um, when it comes to Saudi Arabia, no doubt he will want to speak to them about the post-war uh, situation in Gaza, um, perhaps see if the Saudi Arabians are willing to help fund the reconstruction of, of the Strip when, when fighting um, ends. There is a lot of talk about whether people Peacekeepers from Arab states are sent into the territory to to stabilize it um, once once the most intense phase of, of, of uh, fighting is over and there uh, there is a permanent ceasefire. Um, and then in Egypt, he will obviously talk about getting aid into the into the strip. This is a huge concern for the international community right now. And as you mentioned, there's massive pressure being put on Israel to allow and do more to enable more aid, more humanitarian supplies to get into the Gaza Strip because of the dire situation there when it comes to food distribution. Anthony Blinken has said that this is the first time in history a whole territory um, is effectively facing um, um, uh, close to a situation that's not far off for uh, not far off of famine and where there's widespread uh, starvation. And Israel is moving um, on that front and it does seem to be making a few more concessions um, uh, towards the US and the international community. And it's very much stating that it's doing um, even more to ensure uh, supplies get into the strip. Paul, we're also getting meetings uh, between US and Israeli officials. What can we expect to come out of those of those meetings? This is something that came out of Joe Biden and Benjamin Netanyahu's call on uh, Monday evening. It was their first call in more than a month. And in a sense, they were trying to dial down the tensions that have been rising between between them and their and their countries because of the uh, the way Israel is, is carrying out its offensive in, in Gaza and the worsening humanitarian situation there. I think a key thing to, be, to watch will be this delegation from Israel to Washington specifically to talk about Israel's planned offensive on Rafah, the, the city in southern Gaza. We don't know yet who will be in that delegation. We, we, we're pretty sure it won't include Netanyahu himself. It seems as if the U.S. wants Israel to cancel those plans, that the U.S. doesn't want uh, an assault on Rafah under any circumstances. It will be very difficult, though, for them to convince Netanyahu and the Israeli government that that's the way to go, because Netanyahu insists, and he insists on a very regular basis in no uncertain terms, that Israel has to go into Rafah. It says that that's the last bastion of Hamas, and there's no way of achieving its goal of destroying Hamas as a military organization unless it sends troops into Israel. So that will, if Israel does decide to, to go ahead with that plan, that will be a very big point of contention between, um, uh, between itself and the US and, and the rest of the world. Paul Wallace, thank you very much indeed with the latest in terms of what is transpiring in the Middle East and the urgency, of course, around the situation in Gaza. Now to your day ahead, everything else that we are looking ahead to today, some of the key items. UK CPI, really, really important, of course, the inflation data out of the UK, 7 a.m. UK time, the expectation year on year for the month of February, that number is expected to fall from 4% in January year on year to 3.5% in February. Really important, of course, as we lead up to the Bank of England's decision on Thursday. Expectations from the market still that the BOE is going to hold, of course, but whether or not expectations change around the future cuts from the BOE, whether that gets pulled forward, will land and could be informed, of course, by this inflation data. Meanwhile, the ECB, Lagarde speaking, 8.45 a.m. UK time, one of the most important speeches of the year for the head of the European Central Bank. Will she reiterate her view that June is most likely for the first cut to come through from the ECB? Meanwhile, of course, it is the Fed decision. We've talked about the fact that it's those economic projections and the press conference from Jay Powell. He sounded relatively dovish in those committee hearings. Will he reiterate that? And will those economic projections, will the dot plots be adjusted? That, 6 p.m. UK time, the central bank decision, of course, and press conference of the day.
Meanwhile, Reddit is set to price one of the year's most closely watched U.S. IPOs. That's later today with the company and some existing shareholders seeking to raise as much as $748 million. That's according to company filings. It plans to begin trading on the New York Stock Exchange Thursday under the symbol RDDT. You can ups, uh, get a roundup, of course, of stories you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Tell my subscribers can go to D-A-Y-B, go, of course, to get that information. Today, we're looking at a Bloomberg scoop around potential restrictions on some of the suppliers to Huawei coming through from the U.S. administration. A crucial story in terms of the supply chain around semiconductors in China and its ability to move up in terms of value and sophistication. That is one of the key stories on the list. And we're also getting detail, of course, in the build-up and the preview of the Fed. Coming up, I'm going to be speaking to Tanvi Kanchan from Anand Ratti Shares and Stock Brokers. We're going to get her view on India's stock market ahead of next month's election as Indian stocks have come under pressure in the last 30 days or so after a really, really solid 12 to 18 months. The details on that coming up. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, Indian stocks set to erase this year's gains as investors turn cautious on high valuations. The reversal comes a month ahead of India's national elections. Very pleased to say I'm joined by Tanvi Kanchan, head of UAE Business and Strategy at Anand Ratti Shares and Stockbrokers in Mumbai. Tanvi, great to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us. So the Nifty 50, for the context for our viewers, up around 20% in the last 12 months, down about 3% since the start of this month, since about March the 7th. The key question then, is the Indian bull market coming to an end? Hi, Tom. Thank you for having me on. So um, I think a lot of has uh, a lot of things have happened in the last thirty days, so to say. Uh, in the last year, if you uh, saw your large cap indices kind of rallied about twenty four percent, mid and small cap went in the space of almost forty five to forty nine percent. Now, if you look at only a one year performance, yes, it was a substantial rally that happened, and uh, this kind of correction could be looked as uh, you know an investor perspective. Uh, a kind of a stoppage in the bull run. However, if you take a longer perspective into place, that is, if you look at the data from 2018, where that was the last time where large cap, mid cap, and small cap kind of had a convergence, from 2018 till 2023, that is before the rally, uh, your small and mid cap were in the range of about only 10% to 12.5% on a total average returns that they have generated. So the rally mm -hmm. that we saw was more of a catch-up rally. Now, at an Indian market perspective, a 10 to 12 percent kind of a correction is a normal thing that we have seen. We have seen this across uh, data points across the years, and a 10 to 12 percent uh, market correction was any which way is expected was a kind of heavy rally that we saw. Uh, mm. The correction came in the backs of even SEBI kind of infusing some level of cautious uh, to investors, uh, kind of telling mutual fund houses to reallocate, rebalance, and do a stress test on their portfolios. Yeah. So we also saw a lot of outflow on that particular perspective. So Tanvi, do you buy the dip? And if you see a rebound in these markets, what are the next catalysts? Uh, I think the main catalyst for Indian markets is that the fact that we are growing on a substantial basis on the backs of strong domestic uh, corporate earnings. The inflation numbers are well within the targeted range. Uh, our corporate earning numbers that were, uh, you know, around the expected numbers are looking at a further growth also in the next coming years. So the catalyst would be uh, growth in physical assets, which is mainly construction, capital goods, real estate. Uh, manufacturing, domestic consumption. Uh, so these are the main areas that you're looking at growth on a longer term perspective. And when you're thinking about buying assets within equities in India, do you look, do you look at large caps, Tanvi, or do you move down into mid and small caps? How do you want to diversify that view? Uh, so now I think a lot of people are looking at mid and small cap in the overvalued space. And that's something on a long term investment perspective. Uh, I would have a contrarian view. So yes, on a short term basis, you should have a good and a broader allocation to large cap in your portfolio. However, on purely valuation, on purely the kind of pace at which 
mid and small caps have grown in the last 10 years, uh, we firmly believe that on a broader level, long-term allocation, you can look at a small cap allocation in your portfolio as well to a healthier percentage, uh, just because of the overvalued space on a long-term average that the small caps still are at. A big year, of course, the election in India coming up. It's going to start in a, around, around April. How, how do you trade the election? Uh, yeah, we all are kind of anticipating and looking forward to the general elections that's there. Uh, we had three main, uh, you know, uh, election results that came out with regards to uh, Madhya Pradesh, Chandigarh, where the current government kind of had a sweeping result. So that kind of set the record where the, even the market consensus uh, is kind of positive with the current government still coming in place. However, keeping the election results aside, uh, historically, since 1990 till 2019, uh, we have seen a good rally in the Indian markets prior to election. Six months prior to election, uh, there has been a rally to the tune of almost 15.94% on an average aggregated basis. So while all the eyes are towards election, uh, however, we aren't really expecting a broader level drawdown on the markets or the sentiments. Uh, Post-election is something where we're looking at corporate earnings to pick up, where we're looking at, uh, you know, somewhere uh, the liquidity also to kind of pick up in the post-election. So, yes, uh, markets or uh, sentiments are still very positive on pre- and post-election. OK, Tanvi Kanchan, head of UAE Business and Strategy at Anand Rati Shares and Stockbrokers. On the context around the sell-off that we've seen in Indian stocks, at least in the last uh, 20 days or so. But the longer term view, of course, being expounded on there and, of course, how to trade around the election that is upcoming in India. Thank you very much indeed. There's plenty more. Coming up, we're going to get a preview, of course, of the CPI data dropping in the UK, 7 a.m. UK time. And we will continue, of course, to set you up for that crucial Fed decision later in the day. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Happy Wednesday to Autos Now. Audi has just launched its delayed electric model, the Q6 e-tron, the CFO of the company. A subsidiary, of course, of Volkswagen says he's confident the new car will be a success, but remains cautious about the overall market for EVs this year. He spoke to Bloomberg's Oliver Crook. For 2024, we are a little bit more cautious. You know, uh, there are a couple of challenges. The macroeconomic environment... Um, uh, I think competition also increased even further. Um, we have also some supply issues. We still have some supply issues. That's why we are a little bit more cautious. We expect our return on sales to be between 8 and 10 percent at the moment, and our net cash flow to be between 2.5 and 3.5 uh, billion euros. OK, the Audi CFO speaking to Bloomberg. Now to some of the other stories making news today. BlackRock has condemned a decision by the Texas Permanent School Fund to divest $8.5 billion from the asset manager over its ESG policies. The Republican chairman of the Texas School Board says BlackRock's policies hurt the state's oil and gas industry. BlackRock maintains it does not engage in any so-called boycotts of the fossil fuel industry. JP Morgan has unexpectedly lifted its dividend by 9.5% in the wake of a record annual profit. And as regulators signal, they may rethink proposals for tightening capital rules. The firm has paid out about $60 billion to shareholders through dividends and stock buybacks over the past three years. Coming up, it is Fed Day, of course. We're going to have a preview next with Bloomberg's M Lives Venram with the details. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. It is decision day for the Fed, with traders eyeing the future pace of rate cuts. Asian stocks mixed after U.S. equities touch fresh record 
highs. As the UK awaits the latest inflation data here, over on the continent, ECB President Christine Lagarde will make one of her most important speeches of the year. Plus, Bloomberg learns that the Biden administration is considering sanctioning Huawei's Chinese chip network as part of a campaign to protect U.S. security. So we'll be checking in on European chip makers on the back of that Bloomberg scoop. We're checking on the markets right now. Fresh records posted by the S&P yesterday. And again, it was the tech and AI story that propelled those gains with NVIDIA firmly in focus. Some of the other big mega cap tech names also rallying in the session yesterday. Today, though, taking a bit of a breather ahead of that Fed decision. U.S. futures, S&P even is pointing lower by a tenth of a percent. NASDAQ futures also putting lower by about 23 points. And it's Again, it's going to be the focus. It's going to be the press conference from Jay Pounds as he continued to, to reiterate the relative dovish message he gave at those committee hearings. And, of course, what happens with those economic projections? Do they go from three on the dot plots to two? When it comes to Europe, ECB, of course, and Christine Lagarde, that crucial speech from the head of the ECB at around 8.45 a.m. UK time. And then here in the UK, uh, the inflation data as well, crossing 7 a.m. UK time. We'll break that story down for you shortly. The FTSE 100 currently pointing low by a tenth of a percent. European futures conning off by three-tenths of a percent after the gains that we saw yesterday. Let's flip the board and look across our set then. Japanese markets are closed. The yen is still trading, but you're not getting a print on U.S. Treasuries yet, of course. 151 on the Japanese yen, further weakness, down five-tenths of a percent again as markets readjust to this view and no outline in terms of further hikes coming through from the BOJ at that press conference, Governor Wada, but of course the Fed story really consequential as well for the movement and future direction of the yen. 155.50, 151.50. The pound in focus, of course, on the back. And as we build up to that inflation data out of the UK, expect us to drop to 3.5% year on year. 127 on the pound. Brent crude, $87 a barrel. And the Bloomberg dollar index currently just up a tenth of a percent. Let's get to the Fed then and that preview. Likely, of course, to avoid signalling an imminent rate cut this week. Staying focused on stubborn inflation whilst also keeping one eye on that slowly rising jobless rate in the States. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Ven Ram then from our M Live team for a preview. Ven, what are you going to be watching for? We talked earlier to Mark Cranfield about the potential different scenarios that come out of this in terms of the combination of the dot plots and the press conference. What for you is going to be in focus? That's right, Tom. Um, the single biggest thing that I'll be watching for is what they do with the dot plot. Are they going to stay with the three rate cuts that they indicated for 2024 with the December dot plot, or are they going to move to two? That's the single biggest factor that's going to be uh, that's going to be the fulcrum for currencies and for bonds. The other thing that I'll be watching is what they intend to do with the balance sheet, though I, I think that that's a bit premature that can wait for June or July. The biggest decision will be what, will, what they do with the dot plot. Now, if you look at the financial markets, financial conditions are the loosest they've been since 2021, i.e. before the Fed started raising rates. So the markets have already moved on to behaving as though the rate cuts have already occurred, which is why the financial conditions are so loose. So you would expect the Fed to be a bit hawkish uh, here. If they are not, obviously, treasuries will, value, will get a bit OK, so those looser financial conditions will, of course, factor, as you say, into the decision making, at least the signalling coming through from the Fed later today. When it comes to the ECB, then, there seems to be a bit of a coalescing around June, at least if you carve, carve out the, the views of, of the Greeks at this point and the central bank governor there. Is June likely to be reiterated by Christine Lagarde in this speech? What within the speech are you going to be focused on? I think that I'll be focused, as you said, on a reiteration of what she's already said. She said it several times that, you know, June is when probably the governing council is going to coalesce towards a rate uh, cut, towards a first rate cut. And we have heard that confirmation from several key speakers, including the chief economist, Philip Lane, whose, whose views are extremely important on the matter because obviously he carries the heft of the economist, chief economist badge. So, I think I'm expecting to hear a reiteration of June. I don't think there is going to be a pivot, a pivot towards an earlier rate cut because they are going to wait for the wage data and Eurostat data that is not due before, uh, before mid-April. That is not in, well enough in time for the April rate decision. So I think June is when we are expecting a cut. Okay, likely to reiterate June as the 
month when they cut. They push through the first cut, at least in this cycle. Ven Ram from our MLive team, thank you very much indeed with that comprehensive preview of the Fed and, of course, that speech by Christine Lagarde. And we're going to bring you that speech, of course, ECB President Christine Lagarde, in one of her main keynote addresses of the year at the ECB and its Watchers Conference. That's what it's called. That's at 8.45 a.m. UK time. We will, of course, bring you that speech live. To the UK now, where inflation data is due out in the next hour. It's expected to fall to a two and a half year low, three and a half percent from around four percent the previous month. It's the January, uh, the February data that we're getting out later at 7 a.m. UK time. Let's bring in Lizzie Burden, then our UK correspondent, for the details on this and the preview. Um, Lizzie, we're expected to see some significant progress for the BOE at least in terms of moving inflation lower. Talk to us about how that inflation story in the UK has evolved. Yeah, good morning, Tom. Well, inflation at the headline level year on year, as you say, expected to fall from 4% to 3.5%. So this will be encouraging for the Bank of England. It would be in line with its forecast and it would show some progress towards its 2% target. The reason for the fall is it would be driven by food, core goods and services as well. So if you just hone in on the core year-on-year -year number, that's expected to fall from 5.1% to 4.6%. So hopefully some encouraging news on the UK's cost of living crisis. And Lizzie, what is your assessment of what this will mean for, for the Bank of England that you cover so closely? Well, Tom, it's not likely to persuade the Bank of England to give us too many details, much as we'd like them, on when the cuts are going to come. At the moment, markets are fully pricing the first cut in August, but they've got about a 50-50 chance of an earlier one in June. The question for tomorrow is, do we see a more dovish vote split from the Bank of England? Do you see some of the previous hawks, like Jonathan Haskell, dropping out of the hiking camp? Probably not Catherine Mann. She's just been uh, given a second term on the Monetary Policy Committee, one might note. Uh, but if you do see a surprisingly dovish BOE tomorrow, you could see the pound vulnerable. That's according to HSBC. And economists over at City are saying that already the Bank of England is behind the curve. Already it's left it too late when it comes to cutting. Really interesting. The pound currently at 127, one of the best performing currencies year to date. And as you say, we'll see if that adjusts uh, when we get an inflation data out later today and the BOE decision, of course, on Thursday. Lizzie Burden, of course, our UK correspondent with a preview and what this could all mean for the Central Bank of the UK. Thank you. Coming up as we approach the end of the first quarter, are things looking good? Are they starting to turn around for M&A activity in Europe. There's been a flurry of news in recent days. We'll get the overview and the details. That conversation is next on the MA front. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. U.S. supply chain, clearly there's more focus to have more indigenous supply chain in the U.S. for the last several years. Specifically in aerospace, there's a lot of rebuild of capacity. A lot of capacity was shed off in terms of during the COVID and a lot of people went off work. And rebuilding the capacity with increased demand is an immediate challenge and opportunity for in aerospace, which we are working on. Yeah. But we also see in the U.S. expansion of capacity in semiconductor fabs, in EV vehicle batteries, and others, industries of nature. It will take a while for that capacity to set up. It's not going to happen overnight, but clearly we see the trend and it helps us in our automation business. Okay, that was the Honeywell CEO, Vimal Kapoor, on the challenges of rebuilding capacity lost during the pandemic. We're going to switch focus now to mergers and acquisitions. There's been a flurry of M&A activity in Europe this week. Among the deals, AstraZeneca snapping up Fusion Pharma for as much as 2.4 billion US dollars, while Unilever are planning it to cut the fat and spin off its ice cream business. Meanwhile, Airbus walking away from talks to acquire the big data and cybersecurity business of ATOS, sending shares of the French IT company tumbling. And just in the last 30 minutes or so, we also had the deals around the sale of one of the parts of the Roche business in the US to Lonza as well. So at this point, let's bring in Bloomberg Deals reporter Manuel Baigori for the insight into what's been happening. Broadly, Manuel, let's start with the big picture. We come from a week 
year, of course, for deals in 2023. The key question, I guess, for many will be, are things starting to look better? Is this an indication things are turning around? Definitely, Tom. Hello, uh, and thank you for having me on the show. That's the dollar, the, the million dollar question uh, uh, right now. In everybody said, it's like there is a lot of dialogue. There is a lot of um, uh, deals in the pipeline, but uh, people are, are wondering like how much of that will will translate into actual deals into tangible uh, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, and uh, as you well said, uh, we've seen a pickup in activity in the last few weeks. I think uh, Europe is leading the way. We've seen some interesting transactions out of the US and, and here in Asia Pacific as well. Uh, it's still a slow start. I mean, f- feels better than last year, but uh, take into account that last year was a very, very challenging year uh, globally, um, but definitely feels a little bit stronger in terms of M&A activity. We've seen the, uh, the deals announced uh, this week. Uh, in Europe, with that healthcare component, uh, which is always one of the driving industries uh, for transactions, um, and, and that's spanning out into other sectors as well. So uh, still too early to call it for this year. Mm. The expectation is towards the second half uh, for activity to pick up, but definitely good signs of a potential recovery. Yeah, really interesting. So not firing on all cylinders yet. But as you say, Europe leading the way, which is interesting. And you talk about the talk. There's a lot of conversation. There's a lot of rhetoric around around potential deals. And the question is, to what extent that actually is turned into concrete action? I guess on that point, financing is going to be important. Is, Is financing then starting to improve, Manuel? Uh, definitely, Tom. I think I think the expectation is that rates uh, will uh, decrease uh, at some point later in the year, but that's still an expectation. Definitely, financing markets seem to have stabilized a little bit, and there is financing available for the right assets. Uh, it's not what it used to be; it remains quite expensive. Uh, but some companies that have a lot of cash, particularly in sectors like healthcare, for instance, uh, there is still. Uh, you know, uh, interested in, in, in pulling the trigger on some of the deals they've been uh, considering for quite some time, as long as they are uh, strategic to their, to, to their long-term plans. I think financing remains an issue, uh, but definitely feels a little bit more stable compared to, say, 12, 18 months ago. OK, so the financing question remains, of course, in focus for us. You touched on pharmaceuticals, you touched on healthcare here in Europe. Which other sectors, talk to us a little bit more about the activity there, but which other sectors are looking most active to you? Uh, we've seen some activity in other resilient sectors, uh, particularly around industrials. Uh, Tom, I think, uh, I think during the, the low uh, last couple of years, we've seen industrials being pretty resilient. Uh, and then uh, if you take into account the biggest deal so far this year, you, we've seen across sectors, particularly uh, around TMT and also in financial services, uh, the biggest being in the U.S. Uh, here, this part of the world, uh, we've seen a bit of a mix a bag of uh, sector activity from, from consumer to industrials uh, and into real estate. Uh, so um, it, remains, it remains to be seen, but I think, I think industrials and healthcare seem to be leading the way with some financial uh, services deals uh, popping up here and there as well. Okay, industrials, healthcare, and a little bit within finance. What about private equity deal making, Manuel? Is that, is that also coming back? Yeah, Tom, I mean, private equity uh, definitely under pressure to start uh, deploying capital. Um, but at the same time, I think it's going to be a year of exits. I think, I think those investors into the general partners are increasing the pressure into the GPs to, uh, to, to exit some uh, of their businesses, portfolio companies they've been holding on for a while and return some of the capital to, to those long-term investors. And I think, I think that should drive some M&A activity. I guess the key question is whether the timing is right uh, and whether they may fetch uh, the valuation they are hoping for uh, in this environment. I think that's the main question. But it mm. should be a little bit more active uh, for private equity firms this year as well. OK. Bloomberg's Manuel Baigori, excellent deep dive into some of the M&A activity we've seen globally, but of course with the lens here on Europe as well, given the lines that have crossed uh, in the last day or two in terms of some of the deals coming to the fore. Manuel, thank you very much indeed. Now to Bank of America, where the CEO, Brian Moynihan, says it'll take time. 
for the banking industry to work through issues with commercial real estate loans. That's after New York regional lenders alarmed, one of them at least alarmed, uh, investors with its exposure in the space. He told us exclusively how the troubled sector is in what he describes as a slow burn. Industry is well capitalized, has good liquidity. Believe me, from last year to this year, people short up their liquidity across the industry. Uh, commercial real estate is a slow burn. It's a classic burn. In other words, if you go back in the late 80s and early 90s, we had a rolling commercial real estate recession. And, and so there'll be difficulties and we work in that. But, you know, the, the trading attitude, which is these assets got to move at a price tomorrow morning, isn't the way the banking system works. And frankly, that's the, the value of the banking system. We work with clients. We figure out what the, you know, you take a building, you figure out what the ultimate end state uh, rental roles will provide. You refinance it. Sometimes that wipes out the equity. Sometimes it doesn't. We're careful in how we underwrite as an industry. You know, the top 30 banks go through the stress test, which has a, a, an effect that says, wait a second, if you're out underwriting out in an odd way, that will, you have to put up the capital to prove your right before you even get the chance to prove your right. So in other words, your capital requirements reflect your underwriting today, even though recession may never come. And it reflects your underwriting commitments under a scenario where commercial real estate drops by 30 or 40 percent instantaneously. Instantaneously. So there's an effect on that on the industry, which is much more conservative building and much more middle of the road building, which is probably slow down the capital provision to some of these uh, companies. But on the other hand, it's not a bad thing when you get to this point. So I, we feel very good. Does that mean banks might fail? There's been thousands of banks have failed across the last 30, 40 years. That's what happens. Business models change. But on the other hand, the, the quality of the banking system is strong. Bank of America's CEO, Brian Moynihan, speaking exclusively to Bloomberg Surveillance. Coming up, we're going to get more on the Bloomberg scoop around potential further restrictions on the supply network around Huawei. That story is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, Bloomberg understands the U.S. is considering sanctions on a number of Chinese semiconductor firms linked to Huawei. It comes after Huawei unveiled a chip last year that was far more advanced than Washington thought possible. Let's get the details then and bring in Bloomberg's Debbie Wu on the context. Debbie, what do we know at this point about these potential restrictions? So, well, the Biden administration is uh, considering uh, sanctioning a bunch of uh, chip firms that's uh, linked to uh, Huawei. And then uh, Bloomberg News reported last year that um, uh, Huawei has uh, either acquired a bunch of uh, chip firms or uh, built a, a bunch of uh, chip making facilities uh, across China. And then these are the firms, some of the firms that um, the Biden administration is looking to uh, sanction. And at the same time, there are also uh, two uh, additional uh, sentiment based firms that are set to be uh, uh, acting as uh, intermediaries to help Huawei acquire uh, acquire uh, restricted uh, foreign chip making equipment. So uh, uh, these are the companies that uh, could uh, get uh, sanctions by the U.S. Uh, although uh, there hasn't been a uh, final decision on uh, the potential uh, sanctions. Debbie, you, of course, followed this sector and this story in great detail, breaking a number of Bloomberg scoops for us. You, we, we know that China is very adept and Chinese companies very adept at adjusting to these restrictions. So would further measures actually impact Huawei in any real and meaningful way? And what do you expect China and Beijing's response to be? Right. So, uh, the, uh, China has, uh, always said that, uh, they oppose to, uh, uh, the, uh, U.S. Uh, unilateral measures to, uh, uh, restrict China's access to, uh, foreign technologies. They see this as, uh, anti market behavior. But at the same time, the, uh, we could see, we could see that, um, the U.S. measures to, uh, restrict China's or to, uh, try to, uh, uh, undermine China's, uh, efforts to build a world class, um, chip industry may have some, uh, 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 may have uh, made some uh, had some uh, impact on uh, China's uh, development on um, uh, say AI or uh, other cutting edge technologies because we can see that um, China's inability to uh, get access to uh, Nvidia's latest chips are having a uh, impact on the uh, uh, development of their uh, AI technology. So, uh, but as to uh, what the uh, latest uh, measure, the uh, potential measures may have on uh, China's uh, tech sector, uh, I think we we will have to. Uh, Wait and see. 
Okay, Bloomberg's Debbie Wu in Taipei. Thank you very much indeed on the details around that Bloomberg scoop and the focus on Huawei and its supply chains within China. Now to some of the other stories making news this Wednesday. Wednesday, Supermicro, staying in the chip space then, said to, uh, understood to have cut its share sale price target to $875 each, with pricing set to be confirmed just before the shares begin trading later today. The company had been offering to sell 2 million shares at between $900 and just over $1,000 each, the computer server maker has gained nearly a thousand percent, yes, a thousand percent in just the last year on the back of enthusiasm for AI. And Samsung shares had their biggest gain in more than six months after an endorsement by NVIDIA. Chief Executive Jensen Huang was reported as saying he's planning to use Samsung as a supplier of high bandwidth memory chips. NVIDIA unveiled, of course, its next generation of AI hardware called Blackwell at its conference in California earlier this week. OK, from semiconductors to luxury now, Kering is warning that sales at its key brand Gucci will plunge about 20% in the first quarter due to a steep and unexpected decline in the Asia-Pacific region. The French company has struggled to keep up with rivals like LVMH and Hermes as luxury sales have come off the boil over the past year, especially in China. We're going to bring you more on that story through the morning. Another story we need to touch on as well as we lead up to that Fed decision, because the impact is there, is Bitcoin. And some of the momentum around Bitcoin has started to fade. You'll remember a couple of weeks ago it broke through 73,000 US dollars, a fresh record. But the momentum has faded, as you can see, towards the end of this chart. And I mention the Fed because part of the reason why... Many think that you've started to see this slowdown in prices, the drop in prices for crypto and Bitcoin is because of expectations that those cuts may be coming later from the Federal Reserve. The other factor, of course, to think about is that those ETF flows that have supported that Bitcoin momentum and gains, well, those ETF inflows have slowed as well. So the question is, is this the turnaround now or is there further upside to come, particularly in April when you get the halving and the capping of the number of Bitcoins in the market? Talking of the Fed then, here's the expectations of how those adjusted, just to reflect on the fact that at the start of this year you had close to seven cuts being priced in, now you have fewer than three. That press conference, of course, and the decisions around the dot plots are really consequential. So we look ahead to that in great detail through markets today. Also coming up later today, ECB President Christine Lagarde will deliver, of course, one of her main key keynote addresses of the year at the ECB and its Watchers Conference. We're going to bring you that live, 8.45 a.m. UK time. Up next, it's Markets Today. This is Bloomberg.